right. My name is uh, Karine Ketterings. I am a professor here at uh, Cornell University, and I'm co-presenting today with uh, Irstein Olivo, who's a graduate student, PhD student, about to graduate this summer from our program here. I also want to recognize Olivia Gottber, who is a research associate on our team and working on these topics that we're presenting on today. I want to start out with uh, setting the stage a little bit for us in New York. We work in New York. It is the fifth ranked milk production state at the moment. We have a lot of dairy farms and a lot of cropland that supports the dairy industry for us here. Our dairy farms, there's quite a few that are under the concentrated animal feeding operation header, are spread out throughout the state. And um, you see the map here, also spread throughout the state, is water. This is a map of the aquifers in the state of New York. There is water throughout the entire landscape. And that also makes it important for us to address what we do on the landscape and keep clean water clean. You should also recognize here, being part of New York, that we are surrounded and part of major watersheds. One of the biggest ones for us is the Chesapeake Bay watershed. Uh, another reason to make sure that what we do in the landscape um, maintains water quality throughout. CAFO regulations came into New York in 99 and 2000. They were focused on trying to help address water quality challenges and had a big focus on phosphorus. And it was mostly planning based. So farms had to put plants together and still have to put plants together uh, with application rates that do not exceed the nitrogen needs of particular crops. Um, and for phosphorus, it was the P index that set limits on applications. Now, all of this, and the CAFO permit was renewed recently, all of this is plan based. So questions came up about how do we do evaluations? How do we do outcome based assessments? and see if we are reaching our targets. And that's where we started working with a number of tools. The two evaluation tools that we present on today will be the whole farm nutrient mice balance on the left. And then Agustin will talk about the field-based nutrient balances that he's working on us for his PhD. To get started on the mass balances real quickly, the concept is really simple. We take the farm, we draw a boundary around it, and we look at what is coming across that farm boundary in terms of nutrients and nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium is what we're specifically looking at. Primary drivers here are feed and fertilizer. So anything imported onto the farm in terms of NMP and K. On the other end, we're working with dairy farms. So their major export is milk, uh, but they might also be exporting some animals. There might be farms that export crops as well and manure that is being exported to other farms. When we do a whole farm nutrient mass balance, we basically take the nutrients imported onto the farm and we subtract the nutrients exported from the farm. And the difference between those two is called the balance. We can then express that balance in two different ways. One, based on our total acres, so balance per tillable acre or per cropland basis. And the other one is per hundred weight of milk basis. The balance per tillable acre gives us a sense of, can we recycle the nutrients we have on the land base? The balance per hundred weight gives us a sense of how efficiently are we producing milk? How efficiently are we turning nutrients into the product that we're looking for in milk in this case? So we started working with farms on this many years ago. Eventually I had a large enough database together that we could set feasible balances. And we have these feasible balances for nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. We have them in blue for balances per acre and in yellow for balances per hundred weight. And these were set based on a number of criteria, uh, including data from a little over a hundred dairy farms in New York. So a farm that needs the nutrient mass balance uh, per acre for nitrogen that is between zero and 105 is meeting the feasible balances for phosphorus between zero and 12 and potassium between zero and 37. Once we had those ranges, we could report back to farms and they could start monitoring their progress over time. And this is examples of one farm that participated for many years for nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium. And you see the balances. Um, this farm made major changes and reduced the balances for all three nutrients. We can also do the same thing 
in terms of balance per hundred weight and look at our efficiency of production. The thing that makes it really important for us is to also combine those two things. So here we have mill production on the horizontal axis. And then in this example for phosphorus on the vertical axis, the balance per acre. Blue is feasible balance per acre. Any farm that's in the blue area is meeting the feasible balances per acre. Yellow in the middle this is the feasible balance per hundred weight. Farms that are in that yellow box, triangle are doing pretty well in terms of their production efficiency. And when you overlap blue and yellow, you get the green box. And that is the, the sweet spot. That is the target that we're striving for. Farms that participate uh, get their green box figures now, where they can do two things. They can compare themselves, the red dots, to prior years, the yellow, pink, or the, the pinkish dots. But they can also compare themselves to all other farms in our database. And that's the black spots in these figures. So they have a way of comparing to themselves over time and to peers. We also were able, thanks to the participation of, of many farms, to create an opportunity table. And this is basically a list of specific farm KPIs, key performance indicators, that are associated with a higher risk of exceeding those feasible balances. So basically, what this opportunity table allows people to do is dive a little deeper into the box and say, okay, if my balance is outside the green area, what can I do to get inside the green area? And this opportunity table gives them some hints as to where to look. What we've learned so far out of uh, the database is that feed and fertilizer are by far the biggest drivers for mass balances, but that animal density is also a key driver and that for the higher animal density farms, farms that exceed one animal unit per acre or a cow and a replacement on two acres. You exceed that, it becomes more difficult to be in the green box. One option there, if you are more intense, if you have a higher intensity, uh, higher density farm, manure export will allow you to draw down those balances again. Where are we at right now? We have currently 21% going of the milk produced in New York, and this was in 2022. 21% of the milk produced in New York has gone through this assessment. There's a total of 85 farms that have participated and the database is growing. We're currently working on the 2023 summary. A snapshot of the current status. Let's dive into the phosphorus first. On the left, you see the green box figure for phosphorus. You see the star. The star is the weighted average for the New York farms in 2022. And you see the star is in the blue area, it is in the yellow area, and therefore it's also in the green area. That means for phosphorus, we are in the green box weighted average across these farms. <clears throat> for nitrogen, the star is in the yellow area, but it is slightly above the blue box. It is uh, about 20 pounds above the blue box. The tables below, the, the three tables below shows all farms and then on the left, the lower density farms and on the right, the higher density farms. If I uh, look at the phosphorus first on the lower density farms, they're meeting, they're in the green. All farms are in the green. Higher density farms are also in the green. So phosphorus all in all, a really good story for us in New York. For nitrogen, we see that the lower density farms are meeting both the feasible balances per acre and per hundred weight, but they are struggling to meet the feasible balance per acre when the animal density exceeds one. And that emphasizes the importance of watching animal densities and finding ways to export nutrients when the density of the farm is high. With that, I'm gonna hand it over to Augustine to talk us through the field-based balances. Perfect. Um, good afternoon, morning, everyone. And thanks very much, Corrine. And yeah, as she mentioned, we're going to dive now into another of the, these two tools, the field level nutrient balances. So next slide, please. So for this project, uh, we collected nitrogen and phosphorus balances information for uh, 994 field year observation that was across five years and eight New York dairy farms. This was part of my PhD dissertation. And for each of those observations, we estimated um, both nitrogen balances and phosphorus balances. On the left-hand side, we see 
how we estimated the nitrogen. We basically calculate the differences between nitrogen supply to each, in each individual field and nitrogen uptake. Uh, on the supply side, uh, we consider multiple sources, uh, nitrogen from fertilizer, both um, organic and inorganic and in manure, previous manure application, um, rotation credits that we assign to previous crops, and endogenous soil and uh, supply. And then we compare that with the uptake, which is mostly driven by the yield in each individual field, and we obtain that way the balance. Um, on the phosphorus side, on the right-hand side of the screen, is a little more simpler. On the supply side, we consider phosphorus supply by fertilizer or manure applications to individual fields, and then we compare that with the phosphorus uptake, again, mostly driven by yield, to calculate the, the balance, uh, the phosphorus balance for that um, individual field. Next slide. Uh, in general, similar to the whole um, farm mass balances in this dairies, we see that nutrient input inputs or nutrient supply is driving the outcome or, or the balances in general. And if we zoom in into the inputs, we specifically see the manure as one of our largest drivers um, of, of balances. So in this case, in the left-hand side, we see how available nitrogen balances in the y-axis relate to available manure nitrogen application. And we see uh, a positive relationship between the two um, and the average in color for the A farms we work with. Uh, that relationship is even stronger for phosphorus uh, on the right-hand side of the screen. We basically see in the horizontal axis, uh, the phosphorus contributions from manure, and then the y-axis, the phosphorus balances in this fields, and we see that as manure P increases, uh, the balances go up uh, directly, and that's because manure was the main source of phosphorus across all these fields. Um, so managing manure in the systems, or uh, properly managing manure, is a key aspect of reducing those surpluses or keeping those surpluses in, in feasible levels. Um, but as we all know, uh, probably managing manure uh, nutrients is challenging because of the fixed ratio between uh, nitrogen and phosphorus. It, and that's another thing we looked at in this data set. So on the left side of the screen or on the left graph, we can see the ratio between the total nitrogen in the manure and the phosphorus in that manure uh, for all the fields that receive manure and average across the A farms we're working with. Um, and then on the red horizontal line, we have the crop nitrogen to P um, uptake, uh, which is basically around five was on average for this data set. So as we can see on the bars on the left, we see that for most of this eight farms, uh, the, the N to, total N to P ratio was higher than the crop N uptake, indicating that nitrogen could supply, or the manure could supply all the nitrogen um, the crop would need. But uh, we know also that not all that nitrogen is plant available. So when we take that into account, um, we see on the graph on the right, um, that all those ratios become lower than five to one um, in going as low as 1.3 and our highest in this data set was 2.7. So um, this explains why if these farms were to conduct uh, N-based applications, um, they would lead to over application of P. Um, and on average, that over application of P um, ranged between 82 and 290. Uh, percent uh, in the case of um, N-based manure application um, for the extremes across all these um, eight farms. Next slide. However, not all these farms uh, needed to conduct N-based applications because they had the land base to spread their manure. Um, so the reality was, uh, although we know that based on the N to P ratios in the manure, um, they could um, N-based applications uh, could lead to over application of P, um, that's not what we saw in most of these farms. So in this graph, in the y-axis, we have um, the nutrients in, in kilograms per hectare. And then we have on the dark blue, the total organic and inorganic N on average supplied in the manure fields in farm one in this case. In the light blue, we have the actual available nitrogen, both organic and inorganic. And then on the orange with the Y dots, we have the, the P contributions. So in this case, we can see that a farm, and then um, on the green square, we see the average crop nutrient uptake. So in this case, we can see that this farm supply with available nitrogen about half of the requirements of N overall. And that led to the application of the exact amount that was taken up uh, of P in that case. Um, so there was not an actual over application of P because they supply um, only half of the total nitrogen that um, the crop needed. 
Next slide. Uh, but if we look at the rest of the farms, for several of them, from one, two, three, five, and six, we saw a similar situation. However, uh, we saw a slightly different story in farm four, for example, where there was an over-application of P. We see the orange square going outside of the of the green um, rectangle. Uh, and that was because this farm had a very high level of P in the manure because um, part of their diet was high in P. And then in farms seven and eight, uh, we see that the available nitrogen in light blue, the center bar, uh, is close to meet uh, the crop nitrogen requirements, meaning that they had a um, manure application closer to an N-based um, application, uh, indicating, and, and that led to over-application of P2. And in this case, it was mostly uh, led by higher animal densities and higher manure application rates uh, in farms seven and eight. Um, and yeah, as I said, higher animal density. In this case, animal density increases from farm one to, to eight progressively. So uh, in this case, um, the farms with lower animal density may have the opportunity to mix manure with fertilizer overall to maintain, um, to, to keep their balances lower. But in case, uh, in the example of farm seven and eight, they may need to start exporting manure uh, to meet, um, to avoid over applying B. Next slide. So um, some conclusions overall uh, between what Dr. Ketterings and I presented. Uh, we can see that um, Whole farm assessment tools can help us identify opportunities for improvement across multiple farm components, like the whole farm mass balances, not only the crops, not only the, cr the cows, for example, but across uh, the entire system. And that we need these assessment tools uh, to evaluate what outcomes were achieved in the farms, document progress over time, and share that those achievements with stakeholders. And this is something that I think across multiple livestock industry um, has become very important to be able to put a number to an environmental performance and share that. And this is what this tool allows us to do too. Um, in going specifically into the assessments, nutrient imports were key drivers for both whole farm mass balances and field balances, as well uh, animal density. As, as Dr. Kerry mentions, like when we increase animal density, uh, it's become more challenging to, to, to stay within the feasible levels for the whole farm mass balances. And we see that we start over applying nutrients at the field level too. Um, as I mentioned, whole farm mass balance gives us uh, an overall farm picture and field balances uh, can help us assess how we're doing at the field level and see if we may, uh, farms may need to relocate nutrients within uh, their land base. And uh, with that, uh, we wanted to acknowledge all our funding agencies that participated in this project, farmers and farm consultants, uh, Cornell Extension, and different NMSP, NMSP uh, team members that contributed. Uh, we leave you with our contacts information. Please do follow our team on Twitter, on X. We have a Cornell and MSP. And at the end, I guess we're happy to take any questions uh, you may have.